Welcome to Born or Made, the podcast that dives deep into the heart of success and identity. Are the traits that define us as leaders ingrained from birth, or are they carved out throughout our experiences? Join your host, Anne-Marie LaTulip, as we ask these questions to some of the most insightful and inspiring entrepreneurs of our time. Each episode, we explore their journeys, the decisions that shaped them, and how they've molded their own paths to success. So whether you're an aspiring entrepreneur, a seasoned business owner, or simply curious about the interplay between nature and nurture and professional growth, you're in the right place. Get ready for compelling stories, transformative insights, and a new perspective on what it really takes to make it in the world of entrepreneurship. Hello, and welcome back to the Born or Made podcast. I am your host, Anne-Marie LaTulip, and I am so excited to have Stephanie bonte LeBaire with me today, who is a fellow East Coaster, which I love, and I will tell you a little bit more about her. Stephanie is a professional singer and stage performer turned voice and networking coach. She uses her experience performing in opera, musicals, cabaret, and dinner theater to help creative entrepreneurs show up powerfully when they network. That is so cool to me, Stephanie, because like we talked about before I hit record, uh, I also have a a performing background. So I'm so curious and and excited to dive into this. But for anyone who might not be familiar with you, I would love you to elaborate on that a little bit more. Maybe take a couple minutes and tell us about your journey and how, how you've come to be where you are today. Yeah, sure. I have always loved singing. Ever since I can remember as a little toddler, my earliest memories are singing nursery rhymes in the car as my parents would drive me around, you know, and it never left me. I I loved to perform in my high school musicals, in the choir, and I went to college and became a music major as a performance major specifically because I knew I wanted to sing on stages and why get an education degree when you can just do the thing you love. (laughs) So I got my bachelor's and my master's in vocal performance. I moved to New York City after grad school. I sang in operas, musicals, cabaret, dinner theater while working for an entertainment lawyer in Midtown Manhattan who worked on Broadway shows. Uh, So it was a perfect way to pay my bills and have somebody understand when I needed to take an extra long lunch break to audition for something. (laughs) And, uh, I, you know, I've always just loved the stage and using my voice powerfully. Well, fast forward a few years to when I got married, moved to Maryland, uh, and my business was as a singing teacher. And I was teaching kids and adults how to perform and audition. And I had a friend who took me to a business networking event. And I had never had to do business networking to find clients. That was not how I marketed myself. It wasn't a strategy that was part of my tool set as a studio owner, and yet I loved it. I was like, wow, this is such a powerful way, really another version of a stage, to be quite honest, another place to use your voice powerfully, to hold the microphone, to make a great first impression, and to get people excited about what you do. And I also noticed that there was a wide range of skill sets in the room when it came to networking. And I started to really compare it to my journey as a singer and being able to walk into an audition room, for example, and really make a good first impression at at that audition so that they ask you back for a a callback or they hire you to sing in their show. And so I started to translate that and being the kind of action person that I am, I was getting, I wouldn't say bored, but I was sort of looking for additional things to do besides teach voice lessons. And I really saw how I could support communities of business owners with how they were showing up, how they were using their voice and the rest is history. That's now my business and that's what I do. I, I love that. So, so let me ask you, like we said, the, the kind of the focus of this podcast is to determine, are we born with an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial spirit or does it evolve over time? And I think that for people like us creatives and, and uh, performers, it's kind of like a, 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 like a great area because I feel like as, as performers, we're still putting ourselves out there, but not in the way that an entrepreneur does. So if you could speak to that a little bit, first tell me, do you think that you were born or made? And then speak Mm -hmm. to the transition from strictly performer to now business owner. 
you know, talk to a little bit about yeah. that. Yeah, well... I think that there is a little bit of a both and when it comes to born or made. I remember that I've always loved singing. So I think that was something I was born with. Yes. This love of music and this love of wanting to express myself. And I spent a lot of years trying to hold down a job while doing the thing I love <laughs> because I believe that socialization you know, the people around me kept giving me the message that, you know, it's hard to be a singer and make a living. It's difficult to create an income that's going to consistently pay your bills. You really need to have that teaching degree if you're going to be able to make it in the world. And there was something inside of me that just knew that I wasn't born to be a teacher in the traditional sense. Mm -hmm. And I, but yet I still gave in to this idea to some extent that, yeah, I probably should have a day job. Yeah, I probably should have a consistent revenue. And it wasn't until, and Emery, this is another story, it's like a, one of those pivotal moments that happens, it wasn't until the housing crisis of 2008, 2009, when I got laid off from my day job, that I finally sat with myself long enough to say, I've never loved having a job. I've never loved being an employee. Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to do my own thing. I've always rebelled against structure, rebelled against you have to come in at nine and leave at five and you only get an hour for your lunch and you only have this many vacation days. And it always just rubbed me the wrong way. <laughs> and finally, I was given this blessing. At the time, I thought, oh no, I've lost my job. But honestly, it was the biggest blessing I could have received because I was able to sit with myself and say, it's time. It's time to become the entrepreneur that I always, I think, have known inside me that I was meant to be. And I was given incentive because I suddenly had no income. <laughs> and yeah. I was like, okay, well, we better get at it right now. And what was interesting is I was able to replace my income within a year of losing my job because I instinctively engaged in networking, but in a different way than people tend to network in traditional spaces. Okay. I knew the power of relationships to build your business. And I used it in a creative way in order to create that business and be able to pay the bills. Um, and looking back at it now, there's a lot of lessons that I learned from that experience. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I can relate to so much of what you just said. Oh my goodness. So <laughs> I wanna, you just like, there's a lot I want to uncover there because um, I too felt the same way when I would even in school, but when I would have jobs, like, you know, just mundane jobs, like, oh my God, it was the, I felt like a bird in a cage. And at that time, you know, back when I was younger, I was always wanting to perform. That's what I wanted to be doing. And I didn't recognize at the time, like this was my entrepreneurial mindset because all I wanted to do was just, you know, get paid to be at rehearsal or whatever. And so mm -hmm. I was lucky enough to finally get to do that. Um, at 18, I moved to Disney. I started dancing there and then I went on tour and whatever. So I was able to do that for a long time. But when the time nice. came to stop and I had to come back to a real world and, and get a job, it was very difficult, mm. very, very difficult to be in that structured environment. And so that was a transition. And so what I did, and you, sp you spoke to the real estate, uh, the housing crash, and that's what I did. I started doing real estate because, you know, hey, I could still kind of, in my mind, perform and, and, and you know, make connections, like you said, in relationships. So I think that it's so interesting that we both recognize this entrepreneurial spirit and we're able to yeah. sort of transform because right now I'm going through this huge transformation from real estate to business owner and it has been so cool. So I, I love your journey because it sounds a little bit similar. Um yeah. so tell me, where have you I, I'm just dying to know, have you performed on Broadway? Not on Broadway, but it's really funny you asked me that question because I wrote a song. I wrote my own musical, all right? <laughs> I have a my own one woman show. I love called, it. Called Stage Dreams. And I wrote that show out of a, um, I was having like, I don't know, a, I guess a midlife crisis where I decided I was going to go back to New York to audition for a Broadway show. Cause it's the one place I didn't actually perform. I performed on off Broadway, yeah. um, 
you know, workshops, all kinds of new music was happening when I was living in New York City at the time. So I was performing. It just wasn't Broadway. And people would always, always ask me that question. Have you ever sung on Broadway? And so I literally wrote a song called, Have You Ever Sung on Broadway? And how frustrating it is to hear to receive that question because there's a piece of you that's like, it's not the end all be all people. No, it isn't. <laughs> I never have either. I, I yeah. for the record, I really just was, I never even performed in New York. I remember one time I went on one audition in New York City, one, and it was for uh, a tour. And I remember it was, I was there so long. You know how you have to go in the morning and, and make an appointment and whatever. I had to be back for a rehearsal. I was doing some regional theater back in Massachusetts. And so I didn't even get to audition. <laughs> <laughs> I was there all day and I didn't even get to audition. I had to leave. So yeah. That's so a typical story. <laughs> yeah. Right? Right. It is. And it really is. I mean, there's so much music and performing in the world. And yet that is like something that people hold up to this like experience. Like when you audition on Broadway, it's just its own sort of unique experience. But it's it's I, I definitely have auditioned for Broadway. I just have never performed in a Broadway show. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> So do you still, are you still performing or? Is it yes, I have my own acapella group called Drop the Mic and we do pop rock covers. In fact, lately we've been really building up our 80s song list. Oh, I love <laughs> and so, you know, Cindy Lauper, <laughs> Madonna, Bon Jovi, yeah. like we were, we're like doing all the oldies from the 80s and uh, we're having a lot of fun. So yeah. That's <laughs> still awesome. Think. So you still have that creative outlet. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You have to have something to keep you, you know. Uh, creatively engaged so yeah yeah now are you doing in your networking group are you doing a lot of um are you doing a lot of public speaking or yes in fact the reason I created my networking group the way that I did was to create another stage just not not for myself although it is a stage for me but also for everyone who's in my community because I know the power of holding the microphone and this was one of the things I learned when I started to facilitate networking events is when you are able to have that microphone one to many in a networking space, it is your most powerful tool to generate business. Yeah. And so I have lots of ways that my members can hold the microphone and this gets them out of their comfort zone for some of them, right? Not everyone is comfortable holding the microphone. So there's lots of different ways you can do it to kind of step yourself into maybe that keynote presentation level of speaking, but yeah. it's, it's a lot of fun also to be able to practice using your voice and practice your messaging and practice the intention that you have behind whatever it is you want to create. Yeah. Talk to me about the difference from being a performer and playing a role versus being yourself on stage giving a keynote. I want to hear what you think. I've said this before. I'm probably my audience is sick of me saying it, but I say it a lot. It's like, you give me a script and a character and I'm, I'm good. I am yeah. good. But if you yeah. put me up there as myself to talk. Yeah. You know, this was one of my biggest fears when I first started going into traditional networking spaces as a performer and a singing, you know, yeah. teacher. I had the same thought. Yeah. You can give me a script. I can play a role. I can memorize the lines. Yeah. I can memorize the music. I can take direction. You can tell me where to walk on stage and what inflection to use and, and yeah. all of the things. And I will just do it, practice it, and I'll perfect it. But if you ask me to go in front of a group of people and teach them something, suddenly I'm not necessarily scripted because you can't memorize a 20 minute talk very easily, right? That is its own thing, unless you're doing like a TEDx or unless something. You have a slide, unless you have slides or whatever. Yeah, well, you can have like the things that help you, right? For yeah. sure. And I think that's how I started to get through all that was like, well, I just need the bullets. I need the outline. I need the flow, you know, and I actually found out that I'm really great at just speaking through ideas being off the cuff, not have, I'm, I'm much better actually being a presenter and a speaker when I don't have it all memorized, when I don't have it all scripted out, um, because I can be more interactive with the people around me through the conversation that we're having, even if it's one to many. So, but that was one of my pain points. And uh, as I was working through that, I was actually making more connections to how being a singer and a stage performer is similar to being a speaker and a networker than they are different. Ah. Because really it's about finding your unique voice. Like if you're in a show, you're cast in a part because you fit that role in some way. Like you showed them that you were able to either have the voice that fits that part, have the, the type 
you know, that they say uh, that fits that part. And you auditioned in such a way that you made a good impression. You really reassured them that you were a right fit for that role. Right. The same thing happens in networking spaces. So when you come into a networking space, you have to have a clear voice. You have to have a presence about you that is going to attract the right partnerships to you, that's going to attract the right clients to you. And so if you're intentional about that and you prepare yourself, like you would prepare for an audition, you prepare yourself by setting clear intentions, practicing your core message, you know what to say when you're asked certain kinds of questions, and then you show up with confidence and you make those good first impressions in that one-to-one contact if you're in person or even on Zoom, whatever it is that you're talking through. Like it is actually way more similar than it is different in my opinion. It's just about being able to tap into your passion and tap into the purpose that you really have for your business in such a way that you can draw on those skills. Wow, that I love that. Now, when you say one to many, are you selling from stage or are you just giving a talk about a, a particular topic? Well, anytime you speak one to many, there may not be a sales pitch at the end of that, but it is still creating influence. And it's leveraging your time. And that's really the key for me because we are all, we all have pretty full schedules. Yeah. And so we have to be very discerning about where we're spending our time. What networking events are we attending? What webinars are we attending? How many calls are we having with people every single month? Because you can spend a lot of time talking to people and meeting great people, and it doesn't necessarily translate to income for your business. Sure. So when you get clear about what it is you really want to create and the types of spaces that you really energetically align with, then you want to start asking yourself, how often can I hold the microphone one to many so that I can influence the most amount of people in the shortest amount of time? So in networking spaces, it could look like a 30 or a 60 second networking introduction. That's like the the tiny mini version of it. Yep. For me, I usually don't network. I have a couple places I network consistently, but I don't usually go to other networking events unless I'm their guest speaker, because Uh that is really about leveraging my time. And I almost uh, pretty much always can get at least one great connection that leads to a client when I'm given the microphone um, as a speaker in any kind of room. Okay. So are most of your events live or, or, or are they about half and half now? Do you mean live or in person? Which, what do you mean? I'm sorry. Yeah. In, in person. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, obviously since COVID, yeah. everyone has moved to the virtual space. And so there are definitely some in-person things still happening again, coming back, but the virtual is never going to go away. So most of what I do as a speaker is virtual. Okay. And I'm getting excited because I am going to do an in-person conference for my community in the spring of 2025. And so I am anxious to get back to that because I used to do in-person events all the time and I love the energy of in-person. That's just my personality. So I'm, I'm excited to have everyone who I've only seen on little zoom squares (laughs) on my computer (laughs) actually show up to an in-person space and network with me. So (laughs) yeah, that is so cool. It's so funny how zoom became such a thing after COVID. Like now it's, it's actual, it's an actual noun. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) That aside, so you you mentioned your community. So I'd love for you to tell us or anyone that doesn't know a little bit about your business and your community and uh, what kind of people are you helping? Are they in all different industries or? Yeah, well, I tend to support the creative entrepreneur, creative service-based entrepreneur. They tend to fall into three categories. So coaches, so any kind of coach, life coach, business coach, dating coach, LinkedIn coach, like whatever coaching on is a great Uh, especially if they consider themselves a creative. And the creative really could be the creative like me, like they have a background in the performing arts or art or writing or, you know, that sort of thing. But it could also mean that they're creating content. So they're creating courses and books and webinars and, and, and events, all of those types of things. So the coaches... Then the marketing professionals. So anything to do with your website, your social media, your SEO, the email marketing, all the marketing things, right? And then the third group are what I call the complimentary service providers that we all need to be in business. So this is the virtual assistant, the CPA, the bookkeeper, you know, payroll, software that you need to run your business. So anybody who's providing those types of services and can support anywhere from, you know, 
uh, online, they don't have to have a brick and mortar, um, then that those are great fits for my community because we can all not only network together and be great referral partners for each other, but we also tend to sell to each other as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, cool, cool. So what was it that made you realize, I guess, that it was time to transition from, I mean, we touched on this a little bit earlier. It was time to transition from really being a vocal teacher or coach, having your own business in that way, but to really branching out and, and helping all of these other people that weren't necessarily just creative singers, just singers. What, what yeah. was that moment like for you? Well, I think part of it was the discovery that this other world existed. And I didn't realize I hadn't made the connection before that I could do something different. Like when I graduated with my master's degree in vocal performance, there were really only two ways I figured I could make money. One was singing on a stage and getting paid. And the other was teaching other people how to sing. Which, so I did yeah. that for many, many years, right? Like those are the two ways that you monetize that skill set. Sure. What I didn't realize is that actually that was very limited thinking. And it wasn't until my friend took me to that business networking event and I started making the connections to, you know, I could help that business owner with how they just talked about themselves. Everything from the technical use of their voice, like maybe they were shying away from the microphone and they didn't actually like the sound of their voice, to the messaging, because messaging is the same thing as auditioning and picking the right song or picking oh. the right monologue. Like it's all very connected. And I started to see the possibilities and then I got excited. Because for me, and this is just part of my personality, I am, I have some things I like routine around, but mostly I like to do new things. Yeah. I'm always thinking of the new creative idea. What can I do next? What's the next project? What's the next fun thing that I can create? And for me, it was a catalyst for creation to say, oh, what would it look like if I worked with business owners? What would that business be for me? How could I have fun in different ways besides singing, teaching, the same songs to the same kids who are auditioning for the same shows, you know, oh, God. that became, started to become too routine. So, yeah. Uh, just a quick question. Do you play piano as well? Uh, yeah, I have a little bit of piano skills enough to teach voice lessons. Yeah, you know, I'm not yeah. like an accompanist in public, but I definitely can pack out a bass line and right hand and all that good stuff. <laughs> That's so cool. So would you say most of your um, your community is, is, are you, is it just women or do you help men? Too? No, we have men in the community as well. It's more women than men, but that's because that's, you know, I, I'll tend to attract a version of myself. We all tend to do that. Yeah. We have men in the group as well. So they still fall into that creative category of either coach, marketing, or complimentary service provider. But, and a lot of them, you know, have women clients. Um, um, some of them have all kinds of clients, but we, we definitely have a mix. Interesting. And I love what you said about not only are you teaching about, you know, getting your message out there and presenting your best self, but also the mechanics of mm -hmm. speaking. Because, yes. you know, it's so funny that you say that because um, I think that sometimes speaking can be more taxing on the voice than singing, especially mm -hmm. if you're not speaking correctly. Would you agree with that? Totally. And, and the function is the same. So if you are a speaker and you're using your instrument like a singer uses it, you should have no problem using your voice. You should never have a voice that sounds hoarse at the end of the day. You should be able to have stamina and beauty in your voice that you might not necessarily have if you didn't have good breath support. So it's the same exact technique. And I was teaching that same exact technique to speakers as I was singers, just modifying it. And it was really funny too. I was, for a while there, I was doing group voice classes for adults. And these were adults that wanted just to sing for fun. Maybe they wanted to be better at karaoke. But I also got a couple of business owners who came to that class and they were like, hey, I feel like if I learn how to sing a little bit better, I'll also be able to speak a little bit better. And I was like, you're absolutely right. <laughs> so yeah. we had a mix of adults with different real intentions, mostly to have fun, but also they understood, they made the connection between technique for singing and technique for speaking. That's so, yeah, I love that. So do you, are you still doing that? And I'm curious, what... Um, how do you teach people to speak the mechanics of the speech? Is it breathing exercises or do you just teach them all to sing? Is that, is that? <laughs> well, I have taught the occasional speaker how to sing a little bit for fun. Uh, <laughs> but there's a lot of mechanics around the breathing mechanism. And there's also mechanics around resonance. Mm -hmm. 
So resonance is how you sound. Do you sound nasal? Do you sound warm? You know, a lot of the comments I receive from speakers who want to work on their voice are either they get too tired when they speak. So something, there's too much tension. So we have yeah. to work on releasing tension and, in, and improving vocal breath support. And then the other piece is, I just don't like how I sound when I hear myself back on a recording. And that is about resonance. So you can change the sound of your voice. And people, most people don't realize how much you can actually change the sound of your voice. And this is why, you know, some actors are really great at voiceover or character work is because they can change the sound of their voice so much that they sound like a completely different character. And that all has to do with internal manipulation of your resonating cavities. So the, the same thing can happen for business owners who just want to sound a little better. That is uh, so cool. Cool. Yeah. And so we would just go through all kinds of different technique exercises and uh, we would just adjust them for speaking instead of, you know, singing really is speaking elongated. That's really all it is. So yeah. when we're speaking, we're going through pitches really, really quickly. You just, you just don't hold it for very long. So you can't tell, but if you were all of a sudden just to speak wherever on the tone and stop yeah. in the middle of your sentence, suddenly you're on a note, <laughs> singing's just holding that out. Yeah, that is, yeah, that's so true. It, it yeah. really is true. And I think a lot of people, myself included, like people who do voiceover work to me are, are so talented. I've never been able to really manipulate my voice too much. Like I'm more of a copycat. Like if I were playing a role that I knew had to sound a certain way that I could mimic, I guess a mimic is, is the better word, but to just be creative and manipulate your voice like that, I think is a true skill. It is. It's, in fact, there are coaches that work on accents and different voice types. Like that's one of their specialties is they'll help you speak like you're British or speak like you're Cockney or whatever, you know, like they have the, they have the different skill sets to be able to teach that. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Um, so tell me, so your business, talk about um, what's the name of your business? I know the abbreviation. Yes. So yeah. the Empowered Business Networking is my community, my networking community. Okay. And so within that community, do you do one-on-one -on -one coaching or is it just kind of... So uh, my, my parent company is called The Empowered Voice. And this okay. is where I started with my coaching singers and speakers to use their voice more powerfully, tap into their passions, all of that. And that is where private coaching uh, was available. I would say that now I'm shifting more to this networking community. Doesn't mean you can't work with me privately. It's just, I don't advertise it widely. <laughs> I have... I have special <laughs> clients that I still coach, um, but they are, you know, my long near and dear clients. And occasionally I'll open up a spot for a short term contract with someone and support someone through that. But I'm really, really loving how I'm taking all of my technique and knowledge and experience and infusing it into my networking community because it's way more than just networking. It actually includes training on how to show up powerfully, how to network powerfully, how to great, create collaborations with other people. And I use my lesson of how I replaced my income in a year and how that was different than traditional networking spaces. And I teach my community what that is all about and how to do it differently. So I'm, I'm so excited about that, that I've been kind of hyper-focused on supporting yeah. my community in that way. But it's just, you know, if you ask me nicely, I might be able to have a conversation about a private coaching session. <laughs> Do you think that's something that might grow and expand over time? Or is that just your sweet spot is just the really the community work? Well, I am great at both, but I have more joy and passion around group facilitation. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, and this again speaks to the stage piece for me, right? I've always loved being on a stage. I've always loved yeah. being that one to many presenter. And so this community fulfills that love for me of helping people in a one to many um, place. And yet I've created both and by infusing training within it and still supporting, still having one on one calls with my clients and my community when needed. I'm a great strategist, so I love to offer up strategy for how they specifically can show up and give them ideas on who to connect with. Um, so I, I found some extra superpowers that I didn't know I had. I, you know? I know. That's so interesting. <laughs> the, and I keep saying, and I've said it like four, three or four times on this call, but the, the correlation between, you know, the performing bit and then the, you know, networking one, one to many is just so similar. And, and the only 
piece to me is that you're you're being yourself but it's interesting that you say it has more similarities than than it does and probably just something yeah. that he's getting used to right yeah. it, being yourself <laughs> yeah well and because some people will interpret interpret sorry being yeah. yourself as just showing up to an event without a plan showing up to an event and just winging it and this is what I see in a lot of spaces is because they have this, I need to be authentic. I need to be myself. I don't want to put on any airs. I don't want to come across as salesy. So yeah. they show up unprepared is really what ends up happening. And you can have a middle ground where you have prepared yourself. You're clear what your talking points are. You're clear what you want to create, the types of relationships that you would like to develop as a result of networking. And you intentionally enter that space with that goal in mind and engaging still as yourself, but with an intention behind it so that you're not just meeting nice people, but you're also creating relationships that lead to client and revenue for your business. Because we are all so passionate about what we do. And it is so sad when I see people who network, especially when they network a lot, mm -hmm. and yet they struggle with income. It, it, it is, it's about the relationships. I mean, I, I've yeah. said that over and over again, Re relationships are the currency of the wealthy. Yeah. Right? It, it, yeah. It's so true because even if, I mean, relationships are everything because even if it's somebody that maybe it, it can't afford what you're doing right now or whatever the service interchange is, having that relationship down the road, you never know what can happen, right? Yes, so you yes. Foster that, that relationship. And it's a long game, you know, Absolutely. and I know that people talk about this in networking spaces that it's about the relationship. It's not about selling. And... It has intentional actions you need to take through that long game to stay connected to that person so that they keep you top of mind and that you do receive the return on investment that you intend from the beginning. You know, not just meeting them and going and spreading yourself thin at like 16 different networking groups a month when in reality, no one's going to remember you unless you are choosing a focus and really showing up consistently in certain places. Yep. That is so true. That is so true. So where, if somebody was interested in, in being a part of your community or learning more about you, of course, I'll have it in the show notes, but I would love for you to talk about that a little bit about how they can. Yeah. We oh. love to have guests come to my community. Even if you don't join, you can come twice as a guest. And this brings value to you and to my community because they love to meet new people. So you can get a complimentary ticket at ebnticket.com. So E, B as in boy, and as in Nancy, ticket.com. And you can sign up for a free ticket. I'll send you a list of the upcoming events. You can choose one that works in your schedule. And I make intentional introductions. I don't throw you into random networking breakout rooms. It's one of the things that I always didn't like about Zoom networking when we started doing it in 2020. <laughs> I want to be connected to the right people. So I actually hand select the breakout rooms based on who you tell me you want to meet. So, so you're really leveraging that. Yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit more to somebody listening that, that might not know what a breakout room, what is your strategy yeah. there with the breakout rooms? Yeah. So we'll usually have about 60 people come to a networking event. So you'll see all the little squares on the Zoom yeah. screen. And then I have pre-assigned breakout rooms. So let's say we'll divide those 60 people into seven breakout rooms. So you'll have about nine people in a room. And I put a leadership team in that room as well. And the leadership team member actually welcomes everyone, the eight or nine people in the room, welcomes them and says, here's how we're going to network. And then they call each person one at a time to go ahead and introduce themselves and make those connections. And those rooms that you get zoomed into are hand selected by me. And then we come back together and we do a little debrief and then we go and do it again. And so you meet a whole different set of people. And th the other reason I do these hand selected, not just to, to create those intentional connections, but also to make sure you're not in the same room with the same people the second time. Because sure, whenever yeah. you mix those rooms up, there's always a handful of the same faces, right? <laughs> so yeah. like maximize the number of new connections during your visit with us. And uh, yeah, just really give you an intentional experience that uh, you can maximize for your follow-up. So the idea during these breakout rooms is for these people to network with just each other on yes. a smaller scale. Yes. Those people make those relationships that we talked about, right? Yes, exactly. The, the worst thing is when you show up at a large networking event with 60 people and they let everybody talk for a minute. So if you do the math, that's a whole hour of listening people introduce themselves. And I can tell you for sure, no one's listening to those introductions. It's no. a complete and utter waste of time. So if you break up into smaller groups, 
intentionally, and then you've got a leader who's helping facilitate a conversation, now you're actually able to connect, understand who those people are in the room. They hear you. You're able to book some follow-up calls in that space. And it's a much better way to network. That Yeah, it sounds like it's so much more productive. Yeah. Yeah. Well, great. Well, listen, we're getting to the end here, but what I do at the end of every episode is I just ask you some, kind of some random questions just so we get to know you a little bit better, okay? You ready? Okay. <laughs> All right. If you had the opportunity to go to space and walk on the moon, would you? No. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> No way. I'll stay right here. And my husband works for NASA. So I am all about like NASA's cool, but uh, no. <laughs> yeah. Your husband works for NASA? That he is does. He works on uh, the weather satellite program. So those um, images you see on the weather at night, uh, yeah. his satellites take those pictures. <laughs> so it's a pretty cool job. And we go actually watch rockets launch into orbit, but those are just satellites. They don't need people on them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I would not. No, thank you. I'll stay right here on Earth. Um, <laughs> right. So given the opportunity, if you could have dinner with one person, who would it be? Mm, yeah, my business mentor, Heather Dominic. She's been my mentor for 10 years. And any opportunity I have to sit down with her one-to-one -one is worth its weight in gold. <laughs> wow, that was quick. Yeah. That usually takes a, a, a few minutes for people to answer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Are you a dog person? Cat person? Kind of. I'm a cat person. <laughs> I'm, I'm totally a cat person. <laughs> All right. I always ask everybody because I'm a huge dog person, but I, I love cats too. And then the last one, what book has inspired you more than any book? And it, it doesn't have to be a business book. It can be any book you've read. Oh, this one's the hard one. <laughs> <laughs> um, gosh, you know, it's, I have one in mind. It's actually, but I can't think of the name of it now off the top of my head, but it was a book about highly sensitive people. And I'm a highly sensitive person which means that my neurological system is developed differently. I'm one of the 20% of the population who's highly sensitive. And so I have to be in business and in life differently than the other 80% because our world is not created for the highly sensitive. Yeah, no, I, I'm the same. Yeah. 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 And so I, there's this book I read that was really an allegory story of a highly sensitive person and her journey. So it was all this really beautiful story, but she's obviously a highly sensitive person. And I'm, I'm going to have to go now look it up and send it yeah, to you so that I can't, I can't remember the name of it now. But it's, that book, um, I just remember so much of the story of that and how she dealt with challenges and overcame them and, and all of that. It was a beautiful story. I would benefit from that as yeah. well. Yeah. What is your disc? My disc? Oh, yeah. well. My eye? I forget now what my disc is. I, you know, I'm licensed in another personality assessment called Bank, which is based in personality science for sales conversations. Oh, I've never heard of that one. Yeah. So Bank is an acronym, stands for Blueprint Action, Nurturing, and Knowledge. And I am an action first and a nurturer second. Okay. And a knowledge third and a blueprint fourth. So this is how I make decisions. This is like a decision making, especially around buying behavior. Um, so I'm an action taker. So I'm like, I just say yes. Like, and I don't think about it for too long. Uh, <laughs> you know? So that's, that's I'll me. I'll have to check that one out. But yeah, the disc, I've, I've taken all of them, but the disc, I usually find everybody that's in this world is either a high D or a high I or a combination of both. So you should. I think I'm out. a D. I think I'm a D if I remember correctly from yeah. disc. It's been a long time since I've looked at that one, but yeah, yeah, I'm. <laughs> I'm an extroverted, highly sensitive. I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds familiar. <laughs> anyway, well, Stephanie, it has been so fantastic having you on today. I, I really loved learning about, about what you're doing and I found it so parallel. It's so cool. Yeah. And um, yeah, I wish you luck on everything. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was a fantastic conversation.